Hey, everybody, this is Mark, and this is Circle the Dark Mother. This is our October meeting. Um, we meet every um, first Sunday of the month at 6.30 p.m. CST, I mean, EST, sorry. Um, and we do record this and put it on YouTube. Uh, but if you do want to um, attend, um, I will put the link um, to where we post our meetings um, in the YouTube, so you can take a look at that. And if not, of course, we do record. So I'm going to tur turn it over to our member, Richard, um, one of our, um, you know, our, our um, bishops in this tradition, and pass it over to him. Hello, I'm, I'm Richard Crow. Um, today, I'd like to introduce Oberon Zell Ravenheart. Um, he, he's one of the major movers in uh, the pagan community. Um, he's been a big, contrib he's contributed a lot um, to my personal path. Um, and he has a lot to offer. He has a lot to share. Uh, he's an artist. He is um, a book writer, um, a, a modern shaman, um, a wizard, uh, somebody that, that I value as, as a friend and someone that I wanted to uh, bring here today to, to share about the church, the Church of All Worlds. Um, I've had many wonderful conversations with Oberon about the Church of All Worlds, and and I think the community should should know about about what he has to offer. Um, so I'm going to leave it to Oberon. So thank you for coming. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I I figure you probably will have questions, and I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I'm not entirely sure where to begin, but I would like to at least um, start off by. Uh, giving our mission statement. This, by the way, is the um, uh, is the symbol of the Church of All Worlds, nine concentric circles formed in the shape of a labyrinth, and we call it the Deorinth, and it's evolved over the years. When we It was originally proposed in the novel, science fiction novel, from which we drew our initial inspiration, which was Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert Heinlein, and it was published in 1961. And it, um, it, it presented the idea of a church of all worlds and gave a little bit of a prescription of how one might set up such a thing, which was pretty cool. And in the book, the symbol was nine circles representing the nine planetary orbits. Of course, now we've only got eight of them, but we can add the ninth for the Oort cloud or something out there, you know, it's, it's cool. So we were using that for a while, just simply nine concentric circles. And then somebody said, well, these will look like a bunch of uh, separate barriers, you know, rather than progression. And we were envisioning the idea of progressing inward through the circles as one advanced in the, in the church. So um, that's what we had in mind from the outer to the inner. So after a little bit of thinking about it, I redrew the design a little bit. So it's no longer um, separate rings. It's it now weaves them into a design that incorporates the, um, uh, see if you can get it there, the shape of the goddess uh, in the that position. It moves around it. But if you turn it over, you can also see the form of the god in it, which is pretty neat, you know? So that's become our symbol. And the, the basic mission statement which we've held to for quite a while. Well, our initial mission statement when we first started out way back in the early 60s, it, it all began in 1962, April 7th, with uh, water sharing. In the, in the novel, uh, uh, the Church of All Worlds is kind of instigated by a, uh, the first human being who was born on the planet Mars. And there was the first expedition in the story crashes and everybody's killed. But there's one baby that was conceived along the road. And he was found and rescued by some ancient wise Martian people who live under the ground and nobody knows about. And 25 years later, an, a second expedition comes. There had been wars and stuff that had delayed it, much like our moon landing, you know. And they find this kid. He's no longer a kid, of course. He's a grown man, and they bring him back to Earth. But he's been raised by Martians, you know, with Martian perspective and Martian teachings and development of Martian abilities and such like that. And on Mars, since there's water is a precious commodity, 
um, sharing water is the ultimate sacrament. You know, that's how, how you connect with somebody. You, because it's a pledge of the thing that we have in common with all life. And so the phrase is said, as you, as you share the water, as you say, um, water shared is life shared. May you never thirst. And that has become the essential right of the real life church of all worlds, which we formed following that inspiration and many others, of course, we were, those of us who began this thing had kind of grown up um, steeped in folklore and classical mythology. So we really had a very strong pagan perspective and we were the first church, first organization to proclaim ourselves to be pagan. Because somebody asked once, he said, well, what kind of a church is this? And, you know, are you some kind of Eastern or Christian or what are you? Because funny religions were coming out of the woodwork back in those days. And I said, well, I guess you could say we're pagans. Because that seemed to make more sense than anything else. And, well, that's how it all began. And that was in 1967. In any case, um, it's been quite a saga. And the uh, initial mission statement that we had when we first began with just a little water brotherhood back in our college days was simply to make the world safe for people like us. And, and that kept us busy for a while working on that mission. And I think we've succeeded remarkably well. And many years later on, we held a big uh, special clergy retreat um, decades later, back in the 90s. And we came up with a new updated mission statement that we've held to ever since. And that is to evolve a network of information, mythology, and experience to awaken the divine within and to provide a context and stimulus for reawakening Gaia and reuniting her children through tribal community dedicated to responsible stewardship and the evolution of consciousness. So I think that kind of lays out what our fundamental purpose is all about. But, um, you know, but we have developed over time, you know, a lot of coherent stuff. We've been written about in over a hundred books that talk about the emergence and evolution of the pagan community, which is, which is pretty awesome. And, and many of them give an excellent account of the Church of All Worlds. In fact, most of them do. Uh, probably the most well-known is Margot Adler's Drawing Down the Moon, and the section on the Church of All Worlds is, is just excellent. It gives all of our history and stuff. And once we had proclaimed ourselves to be pagan, we I would hear about some other group somewhere that was, uh, you know, doing pagany kind of stuff. There would be some people doing Greek stuff over there, or some people doing Egyptian over here or Celtic or Druidic or something. And I would hear about these folks. And um, so I would contact them and I'd say, hey, you guys sound like pagans and we're pagans. So let's all be pagans together, la di da, you know? And everybody said, yeah, cool. That's what we are. We're all pagans. So let's be pagans together. And that was quite radical because before that, you know, each group is kind of individual and autonomous. They didn't really think they had anything to share with each other. I mean, what did Greeks have to share with Egyptians or Druids, you know? But by adopting a common umbrella designation, it brought people into a larger community. And many, many years later in my studies of history, I came across uh, something really that fascinated me. And that was Benjamin Franklin he was asked at one point what he thought was his greatest invention. And he said, Americans, because he was the guy who coined the term American. Nobody had ever used that word before. Nobody ever thought of themselves as Americans. They thought of themselves as Virginians or Catholics or Protestants or, or Mennonites or, you know, Pennsylvanians and stuff like that, all separate, which they were until they started thinking of themselves as Americans. And that gave a common, a common unity that created a solidarity and made possible the American Revolution, which we are all still doing, dealing with. And Pagan had that same effect. Pagan was a concept that created a movement and a revolution. And I'm, I'm really proud to have had a part in that, you know, because I think it's really important. I think we have a lot to offer. 
so if you have any questions specifically, please, you know, ask me something, get me going, and I'll, I'll take off on any of that. But there's your a, a fundamental introduction. So I, Richard, I'm sorry, I, I saw you went off mute too, but I have a question about the church. Um, I know a little bit about it, but not a lot. Um, so is it a, like an umbrella group, meaning that other groups that are maybe somewhat different, but they all come together under one sort of um, banner, or is it a, a cohesive church? Well, it's both. <laughs> We, um, we were the first pagan identified church to become legally incorporated. There were other groups before us who did incorporate, but they did not call themselves pagans until hmm. we introduced them to that idea. So we were the first um, pagan identified organization and we got our full incorporation all the way up for our 501c3 tax thing. And that included a group exemption set up so that we could designate subsidiaries or affiliates that would be covered by our same group exemption of our 501c3. Mm -hmm. And since a church of all worlds kind of implies very high degree of inclusivity, right. we always had the, had the attitude that if people want to affiliate with us, we're glad to have them, you know, more, more into the merrier. Um, we, we tend to be, well, I, I don't know if eclectic is exactly the right word because that almost sounds like it kind of mushes all together. We just honor any tradition who wants to be included and part of it. It's kind of like the whole pagan movement is mm -hmm. like that. You know, if whatever you are, if you consider yourself pagan and you want to be a part of the community, well, welcome home. And it's the way we have, and we can provide that legal protection and we can provide ordinations and um, whatever people need. But we're no longer the org only organization doing that. The Aquarium right. Tabernacle Church has a group exemption. And they have quite a few groups that are um, incorporated under their overall umbrella. But we have that, and we don't have any restrictions on how people may want to um, pursue their particular faith and tradition. So we're happy to have people who identify as, you know, Druids or Greeks or Egyptian or whatever, and um, be a part of the Church of All Worlds. This, it seems like a good thing to do. That's awesome. I I think that's really powerful because, you know, obviously we have various religions, no no dissing on any of them in the world, but they have such quantity that I think it is really important for people of like mind to group together and, and have each other's backs. So I think that's awesome. So thank you. Well, one of the crucial uh, religious distinctions in the world, I think, is between the monotheistic religions, primarily the Abrahamic religions, mm -hmm. uh, basically Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are kind of the main contenders for that, that are all about being the one true, right, and only way. There's only one God, you know, and, um, and, and, and he's theirs, and we're the chosen people of the one true, right, and only God, and anybody who's not with us is against us, and um, if you're not, uh, you know, on this side, then you're wrong. And if you're wrong, you're bad. And if you're bad, you should be punished, you know, hmm. and all that stuff that has given us the horrors of the right. last few thousand years of, of inquisitions and holy wars and witch burnings. Holy wars is a concept I consider to be an oxymoron. I don't think there's anything yes. holy about wars, you know, but that has dominated the world for a long time, at least a couple of thousand years. And it's very annoying. But paganism is um, em embraces a polytheistic perspective, you know, mm -hmm. the multitude of possibilities, you know, in, in the old days, you would have in the town, you'd have temples to a bunch of different gods, not just one, right. you know, and there would be the one, in, like in Rome, they had one temple that was called the, the Pantheon, and it was the temple for all the gods, you know, mm -hmm. and uh and, and I think that that is really important. And we need to bring such a concept back, I think, into the world that there's room for everybody. It's not just a one true right and only way. And if you're not there, then, then you know, you should be killed. I, I think that we can't afford that attitude anymore. Well, we never could really. So it was terrible, terrible destruction. All of the monstrosities of history are all can be laid at the feet of that concept of monotheism. So... You know, paganism is an antidote to that. 
totally agree. I always, you know, t I always say that people have their own path in their own way. And that's, you know, we can all come together and share our knowledge, share our experience. But in the end, it's everybody's, you know, personal experience. So I, I, I really believe that that's super important. So that's awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I feel personally, of course, I'm invested. So naturally, I'm going to say that. Talk to any religious founder or leader, they're going to say the same thing. But I, I really do feel that um, this vision is the salvation of the world, you know, mm -hmm. that we really need it. So, you know, I I know everybody has their own idea and they all feel that theirs is the most important, but I don't feel that it's mine that is the most important. I feel that it's ours. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is to have something that can include everybody. And that's a real, real switch. Most of the, well, the monotheistic religions are exclusive by their very nature. It's right. it's us and then everybody else isn't us. And, and they're like a bunch of Daleks, you know, they hate everybody who isn't them, you know, and, um, and I think we can do better. I really do. And yeah. I think we are becoming uh, more mature and wiser and we've got more access to different cultures and histories and people and, and all of that than we used to have when people were isolated. People would be in their own little country and they'd be separated from other people by oceans and mountains and rivers and they didn't have to get along. There was no need to. But we can't do that anymore. We have to get along. There's 8 billion of us on this planet and we have to get along. So I, I like the idea. My, my favorite metaphor is um, is national cuisine. You know, you, you pick a big metropolitan city like San Francisco, New York, Chicago, whatever. And people from all over the world, all different cultures, they all move there. And what do they do? They all open restaurants. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so nobody wants to fight with anybody or pick a war or burn down the other restaurant. You want to eat there next week, you know. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, and we can appreciate that. You can enjoy the different cuisines and the, the amazing variety of dishes that people come up with and the, the beautiful decor and the music that they play. And, and if they're big enough in the community, they all have big block parties for things like Chinese New Year or whatever it is, you know. And I really think that that is a good model for how the world can get along. We should look at it that way. I, I think that there's a great power of, you know, everything being alive and interconnected, um, right. that there's more strength in our unity than that which divides us, which has been clearly stated by you and, and many other people. And uh, looking at the values of the wisdom of the ages and, and sharing these things, you know, not only being involved with the gray school, um, but looking at the values of the church. Um, that you've shared with me. I, I think they're excellent principles and, and a good way to bring um, human character and human behavior together uh, to coexist and, and to live among each other um, and, and celebrate um, the similarities and differences together. Um, so acknowledging those things, I, I think there's great power. Um, I wanted to kind of go a little bit further into the spheres, the the nine the nine spheres with you, um, maybe where people can get a better understanding of like how would you go through these through these steps. So if they're brand new, they come to you and say, you know, Oberon, I'm interested. I, I want to open that door. Where where do we go in in the steps through these spheres? What what are the requirements? Uh, what's the foundational keys to to getting to not only clergy but clearly understanding what it is that the Church of All Worlds really provides as a priest? Well, that's an excellent question, and I can um, I can give a fairly easy answer, and that is to go to the church website, which is caw.org. Very very simple one there. Uh, the process involves. Um, well, first, um, showing up, you know, <laughs> and uh, the nine circles concept, the outermost circle, what we call the first circle, is just contact people who have some contact, they may, you know, pick up a green egg or, or come to a ritual or, or a water sharing or, or anything really that brings them in contact with the church, maybe read about it, you know, and say this sounds kind of cool, I'd like to learn more. So that's the first circle. And like I said, we no longer equate it with Pluto specifically. We can now equate it with the Oort cloud, which is great because it's lots of worlds out there. Um, and if you really do feel you want to continue, that this is interesting enough that you want to really participate, then join up. 
you know, membership is not very expensive and, um, and, and come on in. And then you get a kind of a, a program that includes like a reading list and, and things to learn about and things to do to, to move on forward. There's a number of books that um, we want to recommend that people should be aware of that kind of lay foundational stuff. There's a wonderful book about the Church of All Worlds specifically and the circle system written by one of our uh, recently, unfortunately, deceased priests, um, Alder Munoak, and it's called Radiant Circles, and it's available on Amazon. All of the books are available on Amazon. And of course, um, there's my books, of which my most recent one, and I think the most important one that I've ever written, is um, Gaia Genesis, Conception and Birth of the Living Earth. And you can look up the reviews on Amazon and see what you think about it, but I think it's, it's pretty important. And um, so you go through that, and, and um, the second circle is um, kind of learning about, about it more, more participating. You know, there's, there's two categories of religion that are designated. One is the religions of belief, and it's all about, um, you know, you, you are defined as being a part of it by believing in the, in the doctrines you know, like Christianity is all about that, you know, Islam is all about. And then there's tribal religions, and they don't really care much what you believe. The thing is that you show up, you participate, you become a part of it. So to the extent that people can show up and participate and be part of the stuff that we're doing, uh, that brings you further in. And it's just a series of progression. The, the first the, the uh, whole program is designed in three sets of three circles, the outer three, the next three, and the inner three. So we get to say we really are a three ring circus because we call each of these sets of three circles a ring. So the first ring is seekers and we identify it with the color green. And that's basically, well, it's, it's like sort of like the apprenticeship in, in the gray school. And the second ring is scions, S-C-I-O-N-S, which means literally inheritors. And uh, that's designated by red and that circles, um, you know, four five and six. And the circles are identified all of them with planets as well as colors. So the outer, um, the outermost ring, the, the green, the, the planets are um, Neptune, Uranus and Saturn. That they're identified with so that's that's how you do it then the next ones in are jupiter and mars and earth i think yeah no that can't be right jupiter mars earth that would be only oh no i guess it is All right the second one. Oh, that's right i forgot <laughs> of course the Oort cloud duh so you got the first ring is the Oort cloud the and neptune and uranus and then it's saturn jupiter and mars is the second ring and then the innermost ring is Earth, G Venus, and Mercury. And that brings you right into the inner circle. And uh, obviously, because of the way things are set up involving study and, and work and participation and doing stuff, you know, at, very, at, at points along, you can get increasing degree of certification. You can get ordained, you know, as a minister, which is these days fairly easy because we recognize training that somebody may have received by some other group, not just our own. When we first started out, we were really the only group, only pagan organization that really had a system of training for clergy. So you had to kind of go through our system. But now there's lots of groups doing that and we, we accept them and recognize them. So if you want to become a minister in the church, that gives you all the ministerial stuff. You can perform the ceremonies and rituals and weddings and funerals and whatever people require who may not be members of the church at all you know often people requiring um, services from the clergy you know they will just need somebody to do the thing you know whatever it may be and so that's 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 what that is about but if you really want to get involved further on and become ordained as a priest or priestess of the church of all worlds then that involves actually serving the church itself, learning the sacraments and and the services and working within it and creating, you know, whatever is needed, ceremonies and rituals and, and counseling and everything. It's, and that's an evolving thing. And that takes a little bit more because our concept of what it means to be 
a priest or priestess is kind of like the the uh, 19th century English churches were. You can send your clergy out to Bora Bora and they can start the church. They can found a branch of the church out there that will be established. And that's how these churches spread all over the world. They sent out missionaries and the missionaries established church. So we expect a priest or priestess to be able to do that, to go anywhere and set up a branch of the Church of All Worlds. So there's that. We call our congregations nests. So, and a nest can be anywhere from three to, well, however many people you want to have to get together. And that's basically a congregation. And it, it needs to be, have at least one person who is a scion qualified to coordinate things and, and arrange stuff and do stuff. And ultimately, ideally, you know, a minister, priest, and priestess, that kind of thing. One interesting little tidbit is that is the word priestess. That was introduced in Stranger in a Strange Land, the Church of All Worlds in the novel had priestesses. And only pagan religions have priestesses. You know, no, no other religions have priestesses, just pagans. So I think that's pretty cool. When I was at the parliament, um, there was a, uh, a booth of very nice Catholic women who were ordained as, as, as um, priests not priestesses, and their ordination was heretical and illegal, and they managed to get some bishop to do this, who was subsequently excommunicated by the church for this heretical act. But nonetheless, they're very sincere about that they are now women priests. And so I talked to them, I said, well, why not priestesses? I mean, you're women, you know, you should be priestesses. I said, well, uh, yes, but we, we don't do that. Um, that's a pagan thing, you know, only pagans have priestesses. They said, yes, I know. So, you know, that's because pagans honor women and give them a role in the clergy. And the, the Catholic Church does not. Specifically, here you are wanting to be clergy in a church that despises you. You know, how, how do you deal with that misogyny? And why do you want to be a part of something that despises you? That, that's like being you know, I don't know, Jewish Nazis or gay Republicans. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. They said, well, we, we, we feel that we need to change it from within. And I say, yeah, that's, that's, that hasn't really worked out very well, has it, from time immemorial? You know, things like that don't change from within. They break apart if, if the change is really forced or they simply exterminate the heretics. But good luck. I, I wish them luck. They were very sweet ladies. And I kind of felt sorry for them because they're fighting a losing battle. But they have heart and goodness. And who knows, you know, maybe they'll create their own um, breakaway church of some sort, you know. And who knows, maybe they may show up sometime in our circles, you know, in our early days in church, in the Church of All Worlds, we had nuns who, who came and hung out with us because they were really nice ladies. And we honored women so you never know there always creates a time for a new beginning for for people to re-emerge or or for that creation of time to you know time is is infinite you know so we, we are in a place in time where everything is opening up um you know coming coming from traditions that, that are very private um very traditional um and then also being exposed to groups and organizations that are very open about teaching knowledge and that they're very accepting uh, of teaching of these principles. Uh, I think that this is a, a circle in a group of people that, that are looking to expand um, more so than to be in a place of judgment. They're more interested in how do I progress spiritually? How do I gain gnosis? How do I um, gain deeper understanding to becoming a wise person or, or a leader or a spiritual influence You know, on, on another generation? How are we impacting this generation to where we, we are role models? How are we the guides? Um, because when you're gone, someone has to guide along the same uh, journey. They, they have to expand and create their own. Um, so I, I think that a lot of young people are, are expanding their spiritual horizons from what their uh, preconceived notions were. 
So they're they're looking for more than what was offered. Um, so that that knowledge and that information is, is why you know this is here. You know, gaining gaining deeper understanding of ourselves, uh, gainer gaining deeper understanding of our, our spiritual engagements within our own communities, um, and building each other up and and making everyone eligible to be the role model instead of just exclusively making it to one specific person to be um, the you know the priest. It creates opportunity for everyone to gain deeper um, not only awareness but um, they, ha they have a sense of power. A self, a sense of control uh, that they they become wise and, and can be those people, and you know you've heavily influenced that. You know, so it's wonderful. Well, and I think that is just a very important thing that you touched on. Um, you know, is that we have to create systems that are self perpetuating, that will um, continue. It's a, it's a relay race. You have to continue to pass the torch. You know throughout the thing and I've I've done this in my own life and my own work and I've seen a lot of other religious leaders who just can't do that you know they 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 just want to hang on to the whole thing somehow and uh, but I think that one of the most important functions of anybody in a position of responsibility and leadership is to select and train up your successors your protégés and, and as you know I've 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 been doing that um, because we have to pass it on too many of my contemporaries from those early days, they're all, they're all gone now. They're all dead. You know, I'm the last survivor, the last one standing. I'm the only one left from the very early 60s. The next one, I think, would be Selena Fox, who came in in the, about the mid-60s. And we're, you know, we just saw each other yesterday at Pagan Pride here. And we still remain friends after all these decades, and we're still busily doing our work. You know, she's done tremendous things in the outer world of the legal stuff, you know, getting the Lady Liberty League and, and laws changed and things like pentacles on veterans' headstones and kids get to wear pentacles in school, you know. I mean, radical stuff like that that she's championed. You know, and my work has been primarily within the community. So it's a good, it's a good matchup, you know, and we published Green Egg and she published Circle, you know, and um, she's got the Circle Farm and we've got Onovan. And it's it's a good it's a good match. So we're both doing good work with each other, and we both respect each other very much. But um, I was just I just had a um, disturbing experience recently at the Parliament. Um, I was introduced to a young pagan, millennial, pagan fellow who was seemed like very sincere and dedicated, and he had absolutely no idea who I was. And the person who was introducing us, which is Ed Hubbard, who you may know of. Um, was trying to say this is the guy who founded the whole pagan movement you know started off the whole thing church of all worlds green egg great school of wizardry talked about the stuff guy had no idea said i never heard of you i don't know who you are what are you who are you to me i'm thinking wow that is like that's like somebody you know being an american and not knowing who george washington was or being a, a witch and not knowing who gerald gardner is i know i i was rather stunned I, you know and um alarmed that there was a generation growing up that knows so little of our history and our community and all that has been done and struggled for by the the people who were the founders and elders and teachers and and all this who tried to make a difference and 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 did all kinds of good stuff to make the world safe for people like us you know and not to not know who they are is i don't know so clearly we are not getting the message across as, as clearly as it should be if there can be people who don't know who we are or what we've done and are doing. It's not like I did stuff 50 years ago and then quit. You know, I'm still at it pretty actively. So no better time than now. You know, you you now he has the chance and the opportunity to, to educate himself, you know, because he's now in the presence of, of the I people. Hope so. I hope so. You know, I mean, um, I, I see people like this as, as those who are um, leaders of their communities in this time. They're reaching out in it they're, through their world of communication. I mean, we had print media back in my day. Now they have TikTok, you know. So, you know, there's new ways of communicating, but it's important to not forget our, our history and our heritage, because we have a heritage, you know, a, a good part of what um, we need to do is to remember those who have gone before, not just in our own 
present time like myself, but through the ages, there have been many heroic people like like Hypatia of Alexandria that everybody should know about, you know. So um, I hope something will happen with that. The hi history education seems to be woefully lacking these days. My hope is that th this is an opportunity for, for that to expand. You know, you, you coming and, and discussing things with the community, having elders from the community reach out and say, hey, this is what's available to you. Here's the ways to network. Here's how to communicate. You know, we're, we're now in an age of information uh, and there's so much information that we never tap into at all. You know, there's warehouses and facilities and organizations and churches and all of these things that is just so infinite. You never touch it all. You never grasp it all. You have to find where you connect and where you plug in and where, where your purpose is and learning your will, learning your true will of who you are and what you want to do. And, and I think this is one of many paths that a person can tap in. And now it's an opportunity. Here, here's an opportunity of resources. Now you are a network. Now, you know, four other elders are now a network that they can actually use this information and make changes in their lives and then be part of that, that lineage, that line, that continuation of that life of the tradition that, you know, now you are inherently responsible now that you have that knowledge to share that information to another continuing generation. And, and I think these are important things to consider, you know, for people that are watching this and people that are truly interested in expanding their spiritual understanding, that this is another, another avenue, another opportunity that, you know, now you, you are inherently responsible for what you choose to use with the information that's provided to you, because now it's in your hands. And now, you know, the elders are trying to reach out to say, hey, it's time for you to wake up, time to consciously be aware, you know. Well, and that's why I have been, um, over the last 20 years, I've been writing books and, and starting a school is for that very purpose, to, to pass on the stuff. It doesn't do any good to learn a whole bunch of stuff and then die with it, you know. <laughs> I mean, what's the point of that? So I have been you know, absolutely fascinated with wanting to learn so much stuff about so many things that that it, it came to the point eventually where I had a great revelation. And now I had to turn around and start teaching it, you know, to unload it. And writing books is an important part of that. You know, and there are several basic important themes, I think, that the Church of All Worlds has has brought in and, and championed that have, have spread very well throughout the larger community. And I'm very pleased with that. You know, one of the first and foremost is reverence for the earth of course back in the early days that was that was not a thing so much you know i mean people were about magical practice and and stuff like that um uh but a, a deep reverence for the earth for mother earth in particular the gaia thesis in general and all the stuff pertaining to that i think is revolutionary and very important because if we can adopt um uh, an understanding beyond just a metaphor that we are all children of the same mother, that all of life on this planet is one single vast organism, and we are a part of that, you know, I think it's a very profound thing. And along with that is the concept that is Church of All Worlds primary theology, that we express as thou art God, thou art goddess, that divinity is not somewhere out there somewhere, you know, not sitting on a cloud judging this from the outside and, and making people out of clay or something, but but something that is a quality that we share we are animated by this we're animated by this the same way that um you know a cup dipped into the ocean is filled with the water of the ocean you know the water is universal and it's a vast universal infinite ocean out there but each cup is seems like an individual that's us we're all these little cups of water but you know um when the cup is emptied it all goes flows back into the ocean you know, we're all a part of that. And I feel very strongly that that's the best way to understand divinity is, is that, in which case we are all divine. We are all divine beings, you know, in all of our, our, our various forms and expressions, but we all share that same divinity, just like the, the water of the ocean is in the same water that is in every cup and every vessel. So that's an important one. And of course, the idea of sharing water as a, as a ritual, I now see that everywhere, every circle that I go to, every ritual everywhere, 
there's a water sharing kind of thing. It's a part of it. And they say, you know, pass it around. They say, well, may you never thirst, you know, may you always drink deeply. And, and the same thing for passing around uh, the bread, the cakes, whatever it may be. It's may you never hunger. May you always have sufficiency. And, you know, and I'm really pleased because, of course, those things originated in the Church of All Worlds. And they're now just everywhere. And the concept of water kinship, we call our members of the Church of All Worlds are called water kin because we all share that. And the sharing of water as a ritual is just an affirmation of our understanding that we are all one. Because just as the water that most of us are composed mostly of, like 80% or so, um, is universal water. It's this, it's this water that's, that fills the cells of my body, you know, once rained down upon the earth from comets, you know, and flowed in ancient oceans and got drunk in and pissed out by dinosaurs, you know, and uh, moves through every cell in our body constantly. We're continually recycling it and, and, and moving it around from place to place. Take it in, we pee it out, you know, it's an ongoing process. Well, the same thing is, is true for spirit, you know. We, we share the spirit the same way we share the water. And that kind of recognition, I think, is a really important thing for that deeper sense of kinship that we seek to recognize with all other beings, not just humans, but, you know, animals and plants and all life. You know, we are all part of one vast superorganism. So, you know, that's, that's a big thing. And of course, um, the, as I said, the, the fundamental unit of the church are nests. So you get a group of people together who share that thing and a nest, a, a nest meeting has one simple rule or well, ritual. And that is the sharing of water. We just, you know, that's, that establishes it. If you do that, then that's all that's required. You don't have to have any specific liturgy or specific doctrine or beliefs or anything else. You just that, that recognition of that kinship. And then from there on, you can play it up all you want to. You can have beautiful rituals and theater and pageants and, and great parties and stuff like that. Our legendary party we used to have back in California was our annual Adams Family Reunion party every October, which was a blast, you know, and it brought everybody together. And then, of course, there's a thing that I consider really is significant and important to the whole pagan movement. And it is a pretty much universal pagan thing. And that's the wheel of the year, the celebration of the solstices, the equinoxes, and the days halfway between them is found in virtually every culture in the temperate zones and some expression of something comparable even in the tropical areas. And it's the turning of the wheel and it's a connection with nature. Pagans don't tend to celebrate, you know, the birthdays or death dates of saints or, or prophets or anything like that. That's, that's not important. I mean, you know, sure, we'll have a birthday party, but that's not the big thing. The big thing that unites us all together and unites us with all other pagan peoples of every culture, every tradition, every nation, every continent is the wheel of the year. And as, and as we celebrate those eight points around the wheel, you know, we, we, it brings us not only together with each other around because we're all doing this together, but it also brings us in harmony with the turning of the earth and the changing of the seasons. And we marry our own lives to that. We have our, the, the springtime of our lives and the summer of our lives and the autumn of our lives and the winter of our lives. And I, I think this is a very important thing. You know, and, and along with all other basic, um, you know, hippie kind of folks, you know, I mean, we very much emphasize freedom, freedom of expression, uh, freedom of intimacy, freedom to love who you want to love, you know, to be who you want to be, you know, and I think that is just, it, it should be fundamentally one of those givens. Of course, we're, we all have free will, we get to be free, we get to live our, so our lives, can't take that away from us. So that's a way in which we seem to stand in opposition to forces of the monotheistic perspective, um, the, the right wing, you know, Christian Republican fundamentalist kind of a, of a dynamic is really diametrically opposed to everything that we are. But the thing is, our numbers are growing and theirs are dwindling. So in times to come, I think we'll see a significant cultural turnaround. We are already seeing a shift. You know, pagans used to be 
kind of weird and scary and stuff like that. Now we're just interesting, you know, and I think that's great because if people are interested, they may come around and check us out and maybe they'll decide that maybe they like it here. You know, maybe this is where they feel comfortable. And I always felt that Jesus would feel that way. If Jesus came back now, I don't think he'd be comfortable in these big mega churches or the Republican, you know, white Christian, white supremacist circles at all. But I think he'd be very comfortable in one of our gatherings. You know, I think he'd feel right at home. Totally agree. So I, I had one more question um, okay. pertaining to the church. Um, so you being the co-founder uh, of the Church of All Worlds, along with, you know, the communities that you served, um, all of the people that, that have been immersed in leading your visions into another coming generation, um, what do you want to leave with the world? Like, what do you want to leave with the communities about the Church of All Worlds that you want to see impacted where people can acknowledge that vision and, and make their own visions possible? What, what do you want to leave as that legacy? What, what is your imprint? What is your, your foot in the sand? What, what is it that you want to leave uh, with the world? Well, that's a, that's a good question. That is actually the question, I think. And um, one that I've been asking myself for a long time. And I think at some point, anybody who's doing this kind of work comes to that question. What is the legacy? What do I want to leave behind? What do I want to re be remembered for? And it's, and it's the community. I, I want to be remembered um, as and, and for the community that I have. So, you know, when I was young, I was one of the ugly ducklings, you know, changelings, as so many of us are, feeling that I was not part of the family and the di dynamic that I was surrounded by, you know. And so I used to go out in the backyard with a flashlight to try to signal the flying saucers to come and take me back where I belonged because it clearly wasn't here. Now, of course, I feel quite differently. I feel that I belong here really altogether. But um, the important thing to me was finding I was not alone. You know, when Lance Christie and I met at their first week in college back in 1961, for both of us, it was the first time we'd met somebody else of our species. Wow, it was tremendous. And um, for um, our entire life, we were like Kirk and Spock to each other, you know, him being Spock and, uh, until he died. He died in, at Salwan of 2010 of pancreatic cancer. I had cancer at the same time and so did Morning Glory. It was like all three of us had to have cancer at the same time, but I'm the only one who survived. So I'm still doing all right. But I miss him because we had that. And there's a sense, um, I've, I've got a book out called Goodbye Jesus, I've Gone Home to Mother. And it's, it's stories of people's uh, leaving their, their Christian churches and coming over to paganism, coming over to the goddess. And uh, Margot Adler alluded to that in Drawing Down the Moon in the kind of the introduction. She talked about all these pagans that she met because she was a journalist at that time, traveling around and interviewing people. She said none of them came to it by conversion. It wasn't like somebody, you know, came up and preached up to them and made them see the light, you know, and the whole bit for, for all of us. It was a sense of finding we're not alone and of coming home. And, and to this very day, you go to any pagan festival and there'll be a big sign up, usually over the entrance that says, welcome home. Because those, I think, are the most beautiful words one can ever say. Because people come in to their first gathering and they say that, they always say that. They say, I feel like I've come home. I feel like I found my people. And then we get to say those beautiful words, welcome home. And um, I think that, you know, if I can be remembered for being able to create that sense of homecoming, of a, of a place to come to find each other, that we are not alone, you know, that, that we um, are a people, I, I, I think I will be pretty pleased with myself. That's awesome. Um, what can people do to 
um, how, how's the best way for people to get in touch with Church of All Worlds? Well, like I said before, go to the website, caw.org. Also, um, all of my books are on Amazon. So if you just plug my name into amazon.com, you will find, uh, I know, all of the stuff that I've written. And you can check that stuff out. And um, the Church of All Worlds website will introduce you to all of it. You know, the people, the teachings, the philosophy, the pathway, you know, the programs and everything else. If it looks good to you, then join up and, you know, and you'll get more. Um, if not, then take what you can use and leave the rest and go on with your life and follow your path wherever it may lead you. And if it leads you to become a part of our community, we will be absolutely delighted to have you because that's how we are. We want to have people who are here. You know, pagans don't proselytize. It's one thing we really don't mm -hmm. do. You know, we don't go out and knock on people's doors and try to convince them that they should come over to our side, you know. Um, in fact, in the early days, it was really hard for people who are, you know, uh, us kind of people to find anybody else. Like I said, we were pretty much isolated and all alone. Now it's so much, much easier, of course. You know, there. You know, you just go to the internet. You know, and it's all there. You can connect up with groups and people everywhere. There's, you know, one thing will lead you to another, and it goes on and on. So the point where you decide that this is your path, well, there's a may, may, many ways you can sign up. You can check out the other ones. You may decide that that what you want to do is is get involved with the heathens, the the Norse, Scandinavian, Viking kind of pagans. That may suit you, or maybe you you find yourself drawn to the Druidic path, or or the Greek or Egyptian or anything else. And if you find yourself drawn to the Church of All Worlds, wherever you are, that's where you should go, where you feel you belong, and um, and you'll be welcomed. You know, I, I like to think, well, I, I do think, because I see it, that our community, the pagan community, is a place where people who are not necessarily welcome in other traditions, mm -hmm. in other faiths, are always going to be welcomed here. You know, we, we take in all the people that don't have any other place to go. And we're glad of that. It's not that we tolerate diversity. We cherish diversity. Yes. We want to have it. We want to have as diverse a community as we possibly can. And so, you know, uh, as uh, Starhawk said in the fifth sacred thing, there is a place set for you at our table. If only you care to join us. That's awesome. And, and so beautiful, so different than what you see in a lot of, our culture right now. Um, I did want to give a, a a plug, you know, for all your books, but especially uh, Gaia Genesis. Um, after her last time, I purchased it and read it. It was excellent. Um, so I'm recommending it to anybody who's listening to this or watching this. Uh, they should go to Amazon and buy this book. Um, really excellent. So great, great ad there because it's it's well deserved. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I, I'm very pleased. I, it was like 50 years in the making, you know, stuff mm -hmm. that I've been collecting and writing and thinking about for, for 50 years. It was all gone into that book. So, and of course, the, the, the figurine, the statue that's on the cover, the Millennial Gaia statue is everywhere. You can just find her all over the place, but you can also find her online if you just um, go to any, anything online with mythic images, Gaia. You know, you'll find her there and and um, join the many people who have an actual representation of Mother Earth hmm. on your own altar. Anything else you'd like to share? Um, I, I know we're almost at an hour here. So anything else you'd like to share or um, just say to people that are watching this? Well, uh, you know... Um, I think if I'm giving kind of like suggestions and advice, it all comes down to, you know, follow your path, follow where it will lead you, uh, follow your your in interest, your curiosity, uh, look into everything, you know, don't censor yourself or your explorations, you know, go for it. And if you find something that interests you, keep going, you know, and um, you will have amazing journey amazing adventures and meet incredible people you know it's it's a wonderful world waiting for you around here and I, I assume probably most of the people who are watching this are 
probably already doing that, and I'm glad to have you here. But if you're not already, check it out. And come to pagan festivals. You know, there's mm -hmm. pagan prides going on all over the place. There's major pagan festivals like Starwood and, and, and you know, many of them, actually, all over the country, all the time. Um, look them up. Um, Green Egg Magazine is a magazine that I started back in 68, and it's 55 years going now. The longest running publication of magical stuff ever. Our current issue is 184 issues, and it's a great resource. It has listings of festivals and events and references and connections, and it's online, Green Egg, greeneggmagazine.com. And again, you can just um, Google it, and it will take you there. That's the nice thing about it. You can Google any of this stuff. Google mm -hmm. me, Google Church of All Worlds, Google Green Egg Magazine, Google Paganism. You know, it's all there. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Richard, was there anything you wanted to say or anything you wanted to engage with Oberon? Every opportunity I get, I, I enjoy to spend time talking with Oberon and uh, also with you, Mark. So I, I do appreciate everyone's time. Uh, I know that we're all busy people, you know, expanding those horizons for ourselves and for our communities. Um, so this is this is great. Um, and I hope that anyone watching this, that this leaves an imprint for you to take your successes into the future. Um, anything that you're expanding upon spiritually, um, that this is a new avenue of opportunity, or maybe you're familiar with it already and just want to hear what, what's already been talked about and communicate with those people that are close to you, um, that this is communal um, and this is an opportunity to go further ahead. Mm -hmm. So... I wish you all the blessings in the world and uh, may you have peace, love and prosperity uh, in all your doings. And I uh, wish you all uh, a fond farewell. Thank you, farewell Richard. And blessed be. May and you thank, first. thank you, Oberon. Such wisdom. I really enjoy every time I hear you speak and um, oh. you're welcome to come back anytime you want. So <laughs> thank well, you. Well, let me know. Okay, Mark and Richard, thank you both very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care. Talk soon. Thank mm -hmm. you.